Hi everyone, Nate solves problems here with another video. In this video, I will be deriving the area of a circle using both Cartesian coordinates and polar coordinates. And in using polar coordinates, I'm going to introduce polar coordinates if you're not familiar with them, and then briefly talk about multiple integrals as it applies to the derivation. So, we know that the area of a circle is pi r squared. But where does this come from? So if we think about a tiny little square over there with that has an infinitesimal area piece, dx dy, we can sum up all those squares as we move around the circle and get the area of the circle. And the limits of the integral are going to depend on whether we use stalks if we sum up y first or if we do layers summing up x first. And then summing up, if we do layers, summing up y makes layers with limits dependent on y. Summing up stocks, summing up y makes stocks with dependent on, with limits dependent on x. So doing the layer method, we're going to sum up x. Its limits are dependent on y. And to determine those limits, we have to think about the relation between x and y over along the circle we can relate any point x and y with this relation where r squared where r is the distance from the origin so r squared equals x squared plus y squared so it's going to form some triangle wherever we draw wherever we pick a point so now that we want to integrate the infinitesimal area pieces we want to sum them sum them up we know that our area element our da was dx dy. And this is true in Cartesian coordinates. And so if we first we want to integrate x, which is the the integral on the inside, its limits are dependent on y, are dependent on that relation going from the left to the right. So if we can imagine summing up all the points at a particular y value from the left to the right, and it has thickness dy, that's a little tiny layer of area. And then if we can imagine taking that little layer of area and summing it up to positive r for y values and negative r, we would sum up the entire area of a circle. So evaluating the first integral, the x integral, we have the following, which should make sense, which is twice the distance because it's symmetrical distance to the left of the y-axis should be y the square root of y squared minus r squared minus y squared and the distance to the right is the same thing. Then if we evaluate the other integral we should get the area of a circle and we do. So you can think about try to visualize what's happening here. As you integrate the x you form that layer and you integrate the y you form the entire area of the circle. So if we wanted to do that with the stocks, it's a little bit different. Now we're summing up y first instead of x. So then there's limits on y that are dependent upon the x value you choose. Because if you choose a different x value, you're going to get a different length for y. So same thing as before, we sum it up, sum up the y first, then we sum up the x and we get the area of a circle. Now x is integrated from the limits that y were previously, as you can imagine moving left to right with those stocks to sum up the entire area of the circle, resulting in the area of the circle. But is there a way to make this easier? There is. And we're going to introduce polar coordinates to do so. So if we can imagine that to some point we choose in the circle, it has a distance r away from the origin. And it has a specific y and x value. And there's some theta that we can define from that r to the x-axis, as drawn in the picture on the left. So then we can define both x and y as x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta, based on that triangle we have over there. And in polar coordinates, we're able to define any point using just r and theta. 
So this is the transformation of x and y Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates, r and theta. So if we want to sum up all of the squares again, but in polar coordinates, all the tiny area elements, we have to figure out what they are. We have to define them again, because it's different in polar coordinates as it is in Cartesian coordinates, because the coordinates are defined different. So it's easy that you can imagine that one side is dr. If we move r out a little bit more, we have that tiny change in r. And one side of that square should be dr. But what is the other? So if we increase theta by some d theta, the other dimension ends up being the arc length between those two angles. And by changing the angle d theta, the radius does not change. But it's not changing because we're not going any farther out. The radius is constant, and that little line, which is we're zooming in to infinitesimally small, that curve, or that arc, is just a straight line with length r d theta. So here is that area element pictured with the two dimensions shown and what their lengths are. You can see the dr, as well as you can see the r d theta. So our new area element, dA equals r dr d theta. So the limits for this are much easier than the limits before. r is not dependent on theta, and theta is not dependent on r. As you can imagine, summing up the length, so a little, what would be a little rectangle with length r, so you're summing up r from 0 to the radius of the circle, and it has a thickness of r d theta. And you can imagine taking that and spinning it around the circle, or one revolution, and you sum up the entire area of that circle. To overview polar coordinates, we have the two relations to x and y. And we have a couple other relations. We have r squared equals x squared plus y squared, or just the Pythagorean theorem. And we have an equation to figure out theta if we want, using t the inverse tangent of y over x. So the reason we use polar coordinates is the fact that it makes certain problems easier to solve. When working with circles, it's much easier to think of polar coordinates than it is to think of Cartesian coordinates. And in doing so, we can define each of those points in polar coordinates with r and an angle from the positive axis, theta. So this allows us to work on different problems and just be more efficient with it. And this is going to come up in different applications throughout physics and in quantum mechanics, specifically the particle on a ring model. So if you want a quantum system with a particle confined to a circle instead of a flat plane, you can think of this. And if it's confined to the edge of the ring, its r is fixed. So then it's just spinning around what would be the radius of that circle. So it's just easier to think of polar coordinates instead of Cartesian coordinates. So thank you for listening to me, and thank you for watching this video. Um, like, subscribe, check out any of my other videos. Let me know what new videos you want and how I can best help you and what you're working on. And any other questions that you may have. Thank you again for watching. See you next time.